me into the call, into the call to worship. I'll let, since I surprised folks, I'll let them get seated. So, In the midst of struggle and strife, God is with us. Praise be to God for God's steadfast presence. Even though many things in life hurt and disappoint us, God is with us. We seek God's mercy and grace to heal our wounded souls. Come, bring your needs and wants to God, for God will hear your cries and restore your souls. Praise be to God for mercy, peace, and hope. I welcome everyone here as we gather to worship and give thanks to our God for always being with us. And as we... Uh, just a reminder that if you have a prayer request that you would like to lift up during the prayer time, uh, there's prayer cards in the in the pews. Please fill them out, and during our uh, our song of praise, to hold them up, and the usher will pick them up and bring them up to me. Uh, I call your attention to all the announcements and ask that you would read through them. Uh, with with the end of the week, I asked for prayer for uh, last week. I was really busy, but I understand we have black top at the new yep. church. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Wow. First couple. That, that's, I can't wait to see it. It's going to be a second thing. And, uh, so we keep progressing, and God is with us.
Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 4 through 12. Actually, it's 5 through 12. Let us hear God's word. And furthermore, it is not angels who will control the future world we are talking about. For in one place, the scripture says, we are mere mortals that you should think about them, or a son of man that you should care for them. Yet, for a little while, you made them a little lower than angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them the authority over all things. Now, when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. What we do see is Jesus, who for a little while was given a position, a little lower than angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. And now, Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters, for he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. And we give thanks for the reading and the truth of God's word. Amen.
there are different things that, the, that some of the Hebrew believers were falling into. Uh, it was, the, the immediate danger was unbelief, their conduct, neglect of public worship, weakness in prayer, instability in doctrine, refusal to teach others, and neglect of the scriptures. Now, we know this was written to Hebrews, but what we have to ask ourselves, do any of these things apply to us or the body of Christ today? And I think some of them do. I think we also have to be careful that we continue to live in the salvation that we've received in Jesus Christ. And some of the things that we need to deal with is that we are sure of our belief. We are conducting ourselves in a way that glorifies God. We are part of public worship. We do pray with strength and not with weakness. We have a stable doctrine. Not something that's moving around. We teach others. And we know that the truth of Scripture is our guide and our teacher. As the Holy Spirit brings it alive to us. That we may live the way God has taught us to live. So when we think of these things, uh, we, the, the author goes into these arguments. He says that furthermore, it is not angels who control the future world he is talking about. He's, what he's saying is it is human beings, it is the believers who will ultimately control the future. I'm, I'm distracted by that noise. And it seems like every time I move this arm, so I'm not sure where to hold it, so I'll stick it in my back pocket. <laughs> And furthermore, it's not angels who control the future. The world we're talking about. For in one place in Scripture it says, What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Or the Son of Man that you should care for Him? So he's talking about, at this point, human beings and Jesus Christ. That is where God has placed the responsibility for caring for everything and the responsibility for living in such a way that the world sees that Jesus Christ was real, that what he said was true, what he did gives for redemption and the knowledge of God through the Holy Spirit. And that all of this is true. So, are we living in such a way that people see that we truly believe that all of these things are true? And are we willing to take the responsibility for all the things that God has put under us, has given us responsibility for? So to keep it within this particular uh, area of this scripture, the responsibility for us is to make sure that the body of Christ lives according to the way that God directs us. that we are truly sharing the message of God's love in such a way that new people come and desire to know the salvation that comes in Jesus Christ. That all the things that are burdening us, all the things in our past life that is providing a weight upon our shoulders that we're trying to carry and we don't understand, we may need to be bitter about some of the things we've gone through, that all of those things are cared for through knowing Jesus Christ. Now, let's not deceive anybody that we talk with and say that all you have to do is accept Jesus and all that stuff will be taken care of immediately. And we don't say that, but we imply it, don't we? It's a process. Once we enter into God's grace, once we become the, that child of God, he refers to, in this passage to the children. It's all children, but he specifically responds, uh, uh, is talking about the children who have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord, those children that he calls, call, calls brothers and sisters. Remember, everyone's a child of God. Some are in relationship with God through Christ, and some aren't. So what would our actions look like 
if every person we see each day we consider a brother or a sister. Now, we many of us have brothers or sisters that are burdensome, are problematic in our lives. Our relationships aren't perfect with them. We're not talking... Let's put it this way. Or do we desire for that relationship with a troublesome brother or sister to be healed and made whole? That we could love one another? I hope so. Some of the pain is so deep it's hard to get there for us. But through Christ, we can get there. So with that exception being, being said, are we willing to look at people that we come in contact with as our loving brother and sister and one who is presently separated from God and we want them to know desperately the fullness of God's love. How would we live differently? What would we do differently if that became our driving force, our primary attitude, our primary perspective in the way that we live life? That every person we come in contact with is the most important person in our lives in that moment. It's not about me at that point. It's all about them. The, uh, the, the funeral service that I did Friday uh, for my best friend's mom, one of the things that everybody said is that she loved everybody that came into her presence. Wouldn't it be great that that would be said about each of us at the end of our lives. Everyone loved her. And when she was with somebody, they were truly the most important person in her space. An example, one of my, my friends, girlfriends, who had grown up in uh, fairly poor and in, uh, in Columbus, an urbanite, is now dating a person who grew up in the hills of southeastern Ohio. There was somewhat of a culture shock. But Ginger needed to have gallbladder surgery, and she didn't have any right there that could take care of her, so Lola Fay took care of Ginger for three months. Now, here's one of the quirks of that relationship. If the doctor said that Ginger could have this and this and this, Lola Faye made sure that's all she got. Because she loved her. She thought that was the best for her. And so Ginger finally said, if I don't get some, some fat or some butter or something, I'm moving. <laughs> so they went to the Amish country, to the Dear Dutchman, and uh, she ordered what she wanted, and she said, oh, I just can't wait for a teaspoon of gravy. You know what Lola Faye gave her? A teaspoon of gravy. Because she thought that was the right thing to do. Now, I, I uh, talked to Ginger this, this week, and unfortunately, she lost her husband to COVID, just like Rob lost his mom to COVID three days after. Lola Faye died. But we were able to rejoice that they both knew Jesus. And isn't that the goal? Isn't that what's being talked about in this passage? Don't float back to the old way of living. Stay in the present. Stay in the relationship with God in Christ and live the best example we can live. Whatever that might be. Are we willing to make that kind of sacrifice that every time we encounter another person, they become more important than ourselves? As the scripture continues, and say, now when it says all things, he says all things will come under the responsibility of us, brothers and sisters of Christ. Are we willing to accept 
that responsibility for everything, even that which hasn't even been revealed yet. So what are the things going on around us that we need to take some responsibility for? And, and I know many of us well enough that we're not going to go down the political route because there's all kinds of things that needs to be fixed there. No matter where we stand in that spectrum, on that continuum of belief, it just isn't working. What can each of us do one piece that could move us from where we are to where God would really want us to be, and that's a nation that takes care of everyone, not based on a big overall controlling group, but based on the body of Christ accepting the responsibility in doing that work. You know, we can do that. Some would say, oh, we don't have the resources. We can't do that. Do we truly believe that if God calls us to minister in a particular way, that God will provide the means for it? I do. See, our first reaction, especially when we start getting into the nitty-gritty of some ministry, is how much it's going to cost. Folks, if we respond to God's call in the use of every resource, every provision He's given us, including money, there'll be more than enough. If we truly give to God everything, because everything is already God's, and we allow the Holy Spirit to direct us and the use and the control of all those things, God will always provide, either miraculously and much more often, through each of us, for that which He calls us to accomplish and the way He calls us to be in ministry. It first comes by faith, and then it comes by choice. For even faith is a choice. So are we willing to choose to be responsible for all the things that God places under us? Now, we as a congregation and as individuals aren't responsible for the whole thing. We're responsible for our part. So the most important thing is to find our part. And one of the things that we've been working through for the last few years is what is our part. And one of the parts that we've decided is, is right here in Waterville. In dealing with the children that have needs at Waterville Primary. And last year, this congregation gave in amazing ways. There wasn't one child that didn't have a coat that fit them. There wasn't a child after we started this process that didn't have a Chromebook at home that worked. There wasn't a child that had two or three siblings in the same house that was trying to do all their work in the same place online that didn't have earbuds with microphones so it got quieter and they could hear and they could pay attention. There wasn't a child that went without shoes or clean clothes, or any other needs that they might have. And that's just the beginning. One of the challenges for this year, and probably into the early next year, is a desire to encourage kids to read books. Isn't it strange for us growing up in the era that the only way, the only thing you could read was a book? That now we're trying to encourage kids to read books because everything is on one of these things or on a computer or a tablet or whatever it might be. So what are they going to do to try to encourage folks? They're going to give coins for rewards and we're going to help purchase a vending machine that holds books. 
and the child's, the kids will be able to take their coins and pick their book, and it'll come out of the machine. Isn't that a wonderful ministry? We don't know the details yet. We don't even know how much the machine's going to cost. And we don't know how the, all the books are going to go into it. But I know we can do it. Because kids being able to read will impact their generation. Kids that choose to read, especially the classics, will grow up differently and will have the opportunity to have impact on others. That's what it means to take care and to take responsibility of those things around us and provide for those needs. And I call, call us to prayer as a congregation to see if we can't duplicate our partnership throughout all of the Anthony Wayne school system in every building. But they'll be closed, but they'll be whatever's needed for every child. And it'll happen. Because our district will make it happen when the church takes the lead. And we do it out of love and not for our glory, but for God's glory. That's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to say to us. Take responsibility for whatever is placed below you, responsible for. Now, when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things, but under their authority, their authority as believers. What we do see is Jesus who for a little while was given a position a little lower than angels. So Jesus was placed in the same position as we are, a little lower than angels. That's an amazing statement. That human beings are just a little lower than God's created beings. And that we are given the responsibility, not the angels, but we. Through Jesus, who became like us for the time that was needed for him to teach, for him to go to the cross, for him to take upon himself our sin, the penalty we deserved, and then rose again so that we too can die to sin and be raised again in new life when we ask Jesus to be our Savior. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing that God loves us in this way. And that God trusts us to do his work. Sometimes we forget that. That God trusts us to do his work. So often we think that God, all God wants to do is make sure that, that legalistically we stay along that line that he lays out for us. And so we're fearful that we are going to be punished by God because we mess it up. Well, there could be punishment for messing up. But the truth is that by God's grace, we're forgiven. And we learn our lessons. And we move on from a new perspective. For this writer says, yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God for whom and through whom everything was made chose to bring many children into glory. Who are the children being brought into glory? It's every believer in Jesus Christ. 
and we can experience some of that glory on earth as we faithfully serve God as He calls us. So are we willing to do that? Are we willing to live in such a way that God is glorified and then we experience that inner peace that comes through the presence of God in our lives? For if we look around, we see that many people are searching for peace and are struggling where to find it when we have the answer all the time. We just don't share it. So two things. Are we willing to truly trust God as God trusts us? So what is God asking you and I to do as individuals and corporately? What do you know the Holy Spirit's been talking to you about and you've been trying to say, no, I don't like that God. I want to do something else. God keeps speaking to us through His Holy Spirit. It's there. It's nagging us. And we come to a place we have to finally choose one way or another. Say, yes, God, I'll do it. Or no, God. I'm going to live life my way. And don't we all go through that? And haven't we all made that decision sometime in our lives, or maybe even many times, where we know God was prompting us and we said, no, I'm going to do it my way. I like things just the way they are. God, stop messing with me. I don't want to go that direction. I'm afraid. Think of 1 John where it says perfect love casts out all fear. When we're trusting God completely and we're living in His perfect love, there's absolutely nothing to be afraid of. But we'll say, God, that, that's bigger than me. I can't do that. It's like how many of us, if I would ask you to come up now and speak at the microphone, you would say, I can't do that. I can't speak in front of people. You know, I'll bet you can. But it takes the trust of God to do it. For if God asks us to speak, it's not about the crowd, it's about the message. And are we willing to be the spokesperson for God in whatever circumstances? That's just a little thing. Speaking in front of a crowd. And I know for some of us, we will never be called to do that. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Unless God is saying, I want you to speak to the congregation. And there's still nothing to be afraid of. For God is with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. And if He calls us, He'll be with us. So a simple illustration that comes to this question. Are we willing to live life as God calls us because God trusts us when He calls? Amen.
of prayer. Please uh, remember uh, all those that are printed in the bowl of food and in uh, there's another one. Thank you. John Nicholson asked that we pray for Scott uh, Prolon's family, my grandson's father-in-law, my son Jeff's son Joe died yesterday. So we pray for that family. And then uh, on I asked we pray for Ethel, my daughter, who passed away in October of 1978. And so we keep uh, the family in prayer that are still hurting from that accident. And so Lord, uh, we come to you. So let us pray. Guidance 
as we seek to bless you and glorify you in the name of Jesus, and as we continue to pray as Jesus taught, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion, I invite those, all those that are at home, to, to grab a, <coughs> some bread and, and, and something to drink as it represents the body and the blood of Christ that we share communion together. Remember that we sometimes get so caught up in the, the gift that God has given us and, and we become so solemn because of what Jesus did for us that we forget that God gave us this act of remembrance as a way to celebrate what God has done for us. So never forget that Holy Communion is a reminder of, of the life we have received in Jesus Christ as well as the price that was paid that we can have that life. So as we prepare for Holy Communion, join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful Lord, you know that we are stubborn and willful. We believe that we know the right way to do everything and to heal all the troubles of the world. We resort to this extraordinary means to provide healing only to find that we have not placed our trust in your redeeming love. Our efforts fall far short of the goal of reconciliation. Forgive us our stubbornness and arrogance. Heal our wounded souls and restore hope and compassion to our relationships with you and with each other. Lift us up and cause us to serve you by serving others in the world. Amen. Two things, a reminder that the United Methodist Church, everyone is invited to share in Holy Communion. And also a reminder that uh, we have uh, our, our cup. And, and I, I just found out that one of the ways to make it easier to open is to push it down first and break the plastic pad. It becomes a part a lot easier. And forgive me for not knowing that for the last year. It was on YouTube. So as we gather today, as we celebrate what God has done for us, we are reminded by the bread that Jesus' body was broken and He said to His disciples and says to us, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. So let us eat in the remembrance of Jesus. And that night with his disciples, he took a cup and he poured it. He said, this is a cup of the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink. Let us drink. And be reminded that God, through the blood of Christ, has forgiven us. Let us drink. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this reminder. And we celebrate and we rejoice in what you've done for us in Jesus. Lord, we simply seek to want to we simply seek to bring you glory and honor. So we live in thanksgiving. And in love for you, as you, as you have shown us your love in your Son, Jesus. Amen.
Houston.